Joining me now here in the Knicks Film School pregame show, a team that the Knicks <laughs> have not had a chance to beat a bunch over the past four years, uh, may have inadvertently started to beat themselves a bit on the court <laughs> of the season. And I got to say, I've done three pregame pods. This is the third pregame pod about this team when the Knicks play them. And it's a different state of the team every single time uh, the Knicks have uh, eventually played them. Uh, and joining me to talk about the Brooklyn Nets for the third time, this version of the Brooklyn Nets, is Matt Brooks of Nets Daily. And look, do us, do everybody a favor. Do yourselves a favor, Knicks fans. Go, f- go subscribe to his YouTube channel. It's Appreciate Matt Brooks that. NBA. Uh, the link will be in this bio at the, the end of the, the show. You can go and, and after being so enriched by this interview and maybe even potentially laughing at the Brooklyn Nets. Um, you can go ahead and, and give him a follow on his, uh, his, his Twitter and then a subscribe on his YouTube channel. Matt, how are you doing today, man? How, how are things over in Brooklyn? I'm good. I think like every time I come on, I'm just like, I've lost another five years of my lifespan yeah. because of the Nets. So uh, yeah, we're, we're down what, like we're down, I've lost about 15 years on what I should have, mm-hmm. on what I should have, you know, lived to. I'm good, man. Uh, thank you for uh, plugging the YouTube channel. I'll be doing um, general NBA content kind of, so there will be Nick stuff involved, um, especially, you know, as we get closer and closer to the playoffs. So yeah, hopefully I can do some Nick stuff. I'd love to, I've really enjoyed watching them. Um, I will be there on, yeah, I guess I'll be there Wednesday, uh, watching these two teams face off, which is always fun. Always fun to go to MSG. So yeah, appreciate the plug. I thank you. Of course. And it's interesting that you're, uh, doing some more general NBA stuff yeah. because, <laughs> um, this team, this Brooklyn Nets team, <laughs> Uh, was very interesting, maybe for the right or wrong reasons over the past four years. Yeah, and then you know this season kind of happened. Um, I want to get your your perspective on this because mm. you have a you have a hint more access than the, the two Nets fans that I have. No disrespect to Evan Roberts and to uh and to Mike Biseglia, who are like great Nets fans who were were great and filled in uh, admirably for the role I needed them to. But um, like as somebody who attended media day and. Uh, as somebody who kind of went through the ringer with what this this franchise put the fan base, and I'm going to assume the media through over the past couple of years. Um, I, I mean, this is probably a cliche question to ask, but like, if you had to summarize it in like a word or a sentence, or just how would you summarize what that run with Katie Kyrie and I, I guess James Harden uh, and I guess Steve Nash, uh, I- what that all that was. Can I swear on this show? Am I allowed to yeah, do that? Yeah, go ahead. A yeah. shit show. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there you go. But that's what it was. <laughs> no a shit show that with, with a championship ceiling. Yes. Yeah. It was, I mean, they won seven playoff games. Like, I'm, there's almost a weird part of me that wants this, this current Nets team that is what I don't even like the island of misfit toys. I want mm. them to, I want them to win just one playoff game. So we can say they won more games than the Kyrie KD team last year. That's very um, true. Yeah. I, d- I yeah. don't even know if they're going to get out of the play in. It's the most bizarre. I mean, it's just a bizarre team to watch right now. Um, it feels like a transition phase is probably a good way to put it. I don't know what the move or the direction is for this team. Is it a full rebuild? Is it a retool? Um, the roster is like deep, but almost too many guys that overlap in terms of skill sets. So uh, that's kind of where we're left. And that's what happens when you have three stars that come in and um, basically uh, just making a shit show for <laughs> three years. That's what you're left with. Yeah. Um, that, when I was talking to Mike Biseglia uh, about this stuff and, and what the Nets have gone through and more specifically how the fan base is feeling about it, it felt like a very big exhale that like okay that was that was interesting the highs were high the lows were very low but now we can kind of focus on basketball again and i I do have some basketball questions because it like i don't know if i should be afraid of this game on wednesday but for some reason i kind of am because of (laughs) like the trap game potential leading up to the miami game on friday for the knicks um but as far as just to kind of close the book on on your experience with covering what this this team was, I guess when did you get the inkling that like this could all blow up at the deadline? Was there any hint that like what was going on with Kyrie could lead to a trade request, and then what would follow over the next five days? 
Yeah. I mean, so there was that report that I think came out through Chris Haynes that was like just directly with his agent. Uh, I remember mm-hmm. that drop when I was in Philly, I was down there covering the game. Super fun. Whole beat was down there. We were just hanging out. It was like, we were, I think we were just about to do pregame uh, presser and this report drops and it's like, okay, here's Kyrie's camp putting pressure on the nets. I don't know. Like everybody else, I kind of, we were all talking about, all right, this is probably just like an off season thing. Like we're trying to get the ball rolling a little bit. Um, And then it really starts to fall apart kind of around like just before the deadline and things get a little shaky. And all of a sudden this trade request happens, you know, because of how KD's trade requests went last year, I kind of figured it was just going to be like, all right, they're going to get through the deadline. These two parties are going to stay together and then it's going to blow up in the off season. That's kind of how I always predicted it going down Uh, to see it happen the way it did as quickly as it did um, was shocking. I'm not going to lie. Like I, I think the best way to describe the, this run of whatever the hell happened over the last three years was that this team goes 18 and two in December and looks like the favorite looks like the favorite. And it's like the best they've played maybe other than a couple of those games with Harden, Kyrie and KD. And it blows up within two months. Mm-hmm. It's so, mm-hmm. not even two months, a month. And it's like, I don't think there's a better way to describe how dysfunctional every single party, whether it was the Nets front office, whether it was the stars themselves, Everybody was dysfunctional the entire time. Nobody could get on the same page. There was animosity. There was bad blood. And it's just fitting that that's how it ends. Yeah, to, to go a step further, so Macri and I have a, a Patreon podcast that we talk about the NBA at large. The day of Kyrie's trade request, he and I uh, were going through like the list of contenders. And like there was uncertainty at that moment because the Suns didn't have KD and there was... The net, the, the Bucks had only won like four in a row at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were all saying, like, like, what's the safest bet if you had to bet on something? And I I looked at the league and I just went, you know what? I can't believe I'm saying this. And he went, are you going to say it too? We both looked at each other and said Brooklyn. Yep. That when Katie comes back, that's probably the safest bet because of how dominant, how unstoppable it looked during that 18 and two stretch. Yep. Do you think based on what you, you heard around the Kyrie situation, do you think he pushes the nuclear button if Katie doesn't get hurt? Like if it's still progressing and it's winning, I mean, it's a weird hypothetical, but if Katie is playing in there, let's say they're 26 and five over that stretch. And it's like, Oh, this is they're run They're running away with the one seed now. And he's still in negotiations. Do you think he still pushes that, you know, the, the thing off a cliff? I'm not in the business to predict or understand what Kyrie okay. Irving does. Ah, neither so. is anybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I, I, yeah, I, they could have gone, if Katie hadn't, hadn't gotten hurt, they could have gone, what? It's like, they could have just won out and lost four games over two months. So they could have been 32 and, seen and he Kyrie. still might have done it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Like, I could have seen Kyrie doing that no matter what. Um, because that's, you know, I mean, you saw the pressers that Kyrie did in, in Dallas. He felt disrespected uh, by the organization. And, you know, whether that's fair or not, I think is, is is up for interpretation. But at the end of the day, you know, the Nets played a really risky game in saying, yeah, we don't want to offer you this extension. Um, and and that meant potentially losing KD. And that that's always how it's been. I, so I think that's just a risky game to play. I think there's a part of them that, Throughout the entire process, they were hoping, hey, maybe we can let Kyrie go and KD is going to want to stay. And that just, I just don't think that was ever realistic. Like that, it's very clear that those two were tied together. And if it wasn't going to be like that, KD was like, I don't want to be here. So hmm. yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I think, I think the nuclear option, it's probably always there. <laughs> you know, like he, he said something about KD, like, I'm, I'm glad he got out of there and like he, Kyrie was talking about the dysfunction that you were just hinting at. Um, and I I don't know. I, I'll be interested to see how the Nets continue going forward because I was impressed with the team in 2019 when they, you know, b- built that six seed. And it was, oh, this is like a, an impressive young team that like built this with really no no draft capital. And then you get what the next four years were. And if they're able to rebuild it again without well, they have the, the Suns draft capital and, and like a pick here from the, the Sixers, but without their own draft capital with uh, everything being in Houston, um, 
I guess I'll be curious to see like where the dysfunction ends up lying. If it was just the the sense of this thing is built for more of a, a ground up type of thing and less of a home for superstars type mm-hmm. of deal. Um, but I'll, I'll be curious, man, to see the, how Marks and Co. You know, rebuild this. I'm I'm curious where where you fall on the um the the what's left and where this team goes this season as we now transition into what's what the Brooklyn Nets are currently. Um, the Knicks have passed them in the standings. They they struggle to score, and when they do score, they it's because Atlanta is has, still has not figured out the defense the, outside, the defensive side of the Wild. ball. Um. So if you're projecting a bit, I know you're not, you just said you're not in the business of projecting Kyrie. Let's yeah. project the, the Nets a bit. Uh, is this yeah. headed for like eventually the eighth seed and then losing the eight, seven and maybe even the eight, nine. Yeah. Uh, could, could be it really depends on, you know, how Miami and, uh, and I mean, Miami's the one that's probably going to be the risk to pass them. Um, if they're that playing tournament, I don't feel great about, them like in a one-off game you don't really want to be the team that can't score the weird thing is they can't defend either um which is the bizarre part it's just you know they've talked about it a little bit there's just a bunch of guys that are coming in um and they're like their main defensive pieces and their starters and cam i mean think about it four of their five starters right now are coming from different teams who have different defensive schemes and you're mixing that together with nick claxton who's used to this switch all scheme and they've, they've adjusted over the years, what they're switching, what they're not switching. Um, but now you're bringing in all these different guys and they're just like, look really, um, you know, dysfunctional in terms of how they're working together defensively. There's weird, like even the guys that have been on the roster for a while, you know, with Royce O'Neal and whoever Seth Curry, I mean, Curry's not a great defender, but, uh, they're making little mistakes like over helping. They're just, it looks really off right now. And I, I can't explain that part at all. Um, so not only they can't score and they're not going to be able to score, like when it gets to fourth quarters and stuff, it gets very awkward um, <laughs> unless Cam Thomas is on. Uh, but it, it, it's the defense that's really been surprising for me. I think you look at this roster, you're like, all right, yeah, this is going to be like a you know top 12 defense on paper at the very least. But that just hasn't been the case. So I, I have some questions about their their current rotation because you mentioned it. They have like and this is what I said to to, to Mike the last time he was here, like. The Nets have, I'll use a baseball analogy, a bunch of three and four starters. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't have an ace. They probably don't have a number two, but they have a bunch of solid starting rotation plate pieces that I'd, oh, I'd love to have that person compliment my mm-hmm. two big guns. And I'm, I'm kind of fascinated at the guys that aren't playing that were part of the rotation and, and, and mattering. So just, I mean, at this point, the, the 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 Watanabe piece of mm-hmm. it, um, he was like one of the better three point shooters in the league, and is out of the rotation. Uh, Joe Harris and I'm just I'm box score scouting here. So you who actually yeah, yeah. watch the game, please help me. Yeah. Joe Harris getting six minutes. Steph Seth Curry getting six minutes. Patty Mills is just not in the rotation. Yeah. What's the uh, are they kind of mixing and matching at this point and just seeing what works because the the deck got shuffled or is that kind of a pattern of what's happened lately? No, I mean, that's going to be a problem. Uh, they, and that's, this is without Ben Simmons, who, I mean, all other conversation. <laughs> yeah. 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 At this point. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, I'll say this about the, you know, I think Joe Harris has not had a good year. I would, exp- I, I just don't know what the future looks like for him at all. Um, Watanabe is the one that's surprising to me. Seth Curry is another one. Like he's an expiring contract, and they're not playing him. Not sure why he wasn't traded at the deadline. If I'm being yeah. honest with you, yeah. um, they just have a lot of the same guy. It's a lot of smaller guards or wings. You know, it's hilarious. Like they have every single guy that I think that I've sort of wanted over the years to play alongside Kyrie and KD. Whether it's Dorian Finney-Smith, Royce O'Neal, uh, Cam Johnson, like any of these guys would look great next to two stars. Now that's all they have. And it's just like, it feels really strange and mix and matching these rotations is very difficult. So um, I think for the most part, the guys that are sitting, I agree with in a way I want to play Cam Thomas over somebody like Seth Curry, um, just because I think that's the future for for yourself. If you're the Nets, um, I, I like Royce O'Neal, Dorian Finney-Smith, Bridges, obviously over, over Joe Harris. Um, but I guess Watanabe is the only one where I'm like, 
that kind of sucks. Like he played really well this year and this is what he's rewarded with. It, it's, it's kind of hard to, to see that happen, but that's the difficulty of having this many guys that I think could play, but you're, again, you're not, you don't have those top end guys. The, the Cam Thomas thing is, is fascinating to mm-hmm. me because those, those three straight 40 point games when the team was kind of in flux was like, all right. So I guess Katie and Kyrie are leaving, but Cam Thomas is going to, you know, break Wilt score, break, a. uh, uh LeBron scoring record soon, you know, <laughs> like that, that's just where this is headed. Yeah. Um, the, the sense I get from Nets fans is like, this is a fun player on the offensive side of the ball. If you have no intentions of winning every anything, is that fair? Or is this like, he's young, like he's a yeah. second year player that could even get even better. And especially when you look at how he's already developed on the offensive side. Now you just got to develop the defensive instincts. Yeah, well, he doesn't pass for one. Uh, he just doesn't pass, uh, which is a great. <laughs> like, but he's a bucket I mean, getter. Okay. He's a bucket getter. Like you know yeah. what he is. Um, yeah, I mean, defensively, he's taken steps. There's still games where he's really not good. Uh, he's over helping. He's doing things like helping from the strong side off players he shouldn't. Like there, he does stuff like that. But I, I do think like he's a good athlete. He's solidly built. Like I, I get it. I think there's room for him to turn into something defensively. Uh, maybe not like a top end guy, but I think there's a world where he's serviceable. Um, but I mean, you know, you look at him and it's like, yeah, it's, that's the kind of guy you want leading the show. If you're like, well, we're not going anywhere. We're going to kind of, we're going to just see if we give this guy the, the keys of the offense and see where it goes. The problem is, and I think it's very representative to see how his role is fluctuated and see how the team has handled his minutes. It's representative as the nets as a whole work. I just don't know if they even know what they want to do next. It, it's very weird. It's like, I, I'm not sure they're really prepared to say, okay, we're rebuilding or retooling. Like, do they want to go chase the next star with all these draft picks? Or are they kind of saying, all right, we're going to strip this down. We're going to try to get more draft capital for somebody like Dorian Finney Smith, Royce O'Neal, maybe even Joe Harris in the off season, if possible. Don't know if it is, uh, but you know, that, that it's just, they're so in flux. And I, that was the sense I got around the deadline is they kind of plan to move, you know, once Kyrie was gone and they figured out they couldn't get anybody next to KD, their plan was, all right, we're going to move KD. And there was just kind of like, I don't know what we're doing after that. And that's very much how it's played out. You watch them play. It's like they don't seem to have any identity for who they are right now and who they're going to be in the future. It's very weird. Yeah, I I wonder if, well, first of all, you intentionally or maybe unintentionally didn't say Mikael Bridges' name. And yeah. I think um, you can't trade him away because he's the centerpiece for this KD thing. Like if you, and, okay. I, and I think they believe in his star end or his star potential, which I get, like, I, I get it. Um, I, feels a little, maybe a little long shoddy to me, but he could be, he could be like a one, two time all-star. It's like an OG and an OB thing to me a little bit. I only say that because the, the report that came out, the, the Nets were offered four first round picks for him. And like, if, that's one of the pivots that Brooklyn could do because they have some yeah. pieces that that people will like, and especially contenders will like. like oh, that's a winning player. I'd love Spencer Dinwiddie. Oh, I, I like Cam Johnson. Mm-hmm. I'd love the, and obviously Bridges. Could they just become like Thunder East and just start hoarding all these picks because they they can and they have all these. Yeah. That, if that, I just wonder if that's the direction that that they pivot to. Um, I just, I don't know. I, I look at what they have and it's so clear that they're missing like the one focal point of an offense and yep. all the complementary pieces work so well. But it's so, is it fair to say that like when the Knicks play them tomorrow night, there's no one guy that you have to be like, all right, if we stop him, then the Nets offense will be in trouble. It's very much, a, all right, we'll see who's hot. And then yeah. they become the one guy for the rest of the game. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I just want to add this. This doesn't really have anything to do with what you're saying, but like, I I think we'll learn a lot about the Nets and what their direction is based on the next guy that like big star that forces a trade. And if he has the Nets on their list, like if if the Nets are on there, because that'll just tell you what the Nets perception is league wide. I can't imagine it's awesome. I mean, Katie and Kyrie are really well liked guys, well connected. Um, Don't think they're leaving with a great taste in their mouth regarding the Nets. So I think that'll also inform the Nets a lot about where they should be going. Are they a, a team that's going to be a marquee destination still? I'm pretty dubious of that, if I'm being honest. So I think that'll inform you a lot. But yeah, I'm on your point about, you know, kind of what, what you, how you defend the Nets right now, I think that's exactly it. Like if you have Cam Thomas and, you know, he's, he's hot. All right, let's go blitz pick and rolls with him 
it involves because we know like hey, if we get the ball out of his hands, he's not like a great off ball player. He's probably going to stand to the side and that's that's going to be how you defend that. Uh, if Bridges is going, I mean, you know, I, I don't know about blitzing Bridges, but it's you know, that's another guy you, you can put your strongest defender on. You might do that from the start anyways um, and kind of move out from there. So, yeah, I, I do think in a sense, because the Nets are so democratic with how they're playing right now, it's not a hey, we're throwing the kitchen sink at whoever type of type of defense. From what you've heard and, and I guess seen from the last couple of games since they they made all these trades, um, the guys that are here, um, how have they felt about their new place in Brooklyn? There's this this tweet that went around the other day um, of Mikael Bridges. I guess it, it honestly it was just like an awkward uh, point in an interview where he just looked really sad. Yeah, I think it was because they lost by a hundred to Chicago, and yeah. it, the tweet the caption was like. It's something along the lines of like, we took the joy out of this man's face, you know? Yes. And I was like, oh, this is unfortunate that this is the awkward moment that he got screenshot. But right. just in general, is the mood like, all right, fresh start. We're in Brooklyn. You know, we just got traded from a contender. Or is it like, get me out of here? Like I'll, um, I'll, the rest of the season's fine. And then this off season, hopefully there's more movement. TBD. Uh, they've been on the okay, road. Well. I, I don't travel with the team. So, well, okay, uh, okay, so, I, so there you go. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll have an answer to that uh, tonight, tomorrow. And, and uh, I guess they play at home. So Sunday. So those next three games, I'll have an answer. I will say the last time after the, the, the press conferences, after the Knicks game were, <laughs> they were sad. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like from that, <laughs> were, the ones that you have been to, you know, <laughs> it was a, dep- it was a little depressing in there. Uh, okay, wow. Very quick pressers. Very to the point. Um, mood wasn't especially high. I think always losing to the Knicks. I don't care who's, you know, I don't care if it's guys that have been there for 20 minutes. Like, you know, that is the rival at the end of the day for the Nets. So um, it, it was it was very, it was very short and to the point, I think. So, yeah, um, I, it's, it's weird. I think the entire organization is kind of reeling a little bit. There's just a lot of movement that's happened and uh, transition can be very hard. It, it just can um, so that's probably it's probably the best answer I can give you right now, but I'll have a better answer in a couple of games. I look, I'm I gotta say you've helped me calm down a little bit about the fear of this being a trap game. Like I'm, I'm sure the Nets will play tough and play the Knicks tight, but the way the Knicks are playing right now, mm-hmm. I think just just their their B minus game could at least not guarantee a win, but should be good enough to win with the way that it seems that Brooklyn is in flux right now, as you're saying. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll see. Um, and I look, I don't have a Ben, Ben Simmons question. I, I, I echo <laughs> I don't Zach have a Ben Lowe. Simmons answer. <laughs> well, just like I, I echo Zach Lowe. Like it's become sad at this point. Like this yeah. is a guy that a couple of years ago was like Scotty Pippen on the defensive end. And it was like, Oh yeah, but he doesn't shoot threes, but like, okay, he shoots other shots. Yeah. And now he doesn't even shoot those other shots. And the defense is play. gone. Oh, that's the other play. He also doesn't play. It doesn't um, play. It's a, you know, a knee issue. I don't. I think there's a Markel Fultz. T- I, I, it's weird that those two end up being tied together, the two number one picks from Philly. But like, he needs to go somewhere and just work the kinks out and lose. Yep. You know, and just rebuild. And I mean, it's tough to do that when you have the contract that he has. But yeah, I, I wonder if that's where where that's that's headed for him. Um, whoa. Oh, I just I hear the fire trucks. That's all. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, uh, that, so you know I'm in New York. <laughs> there you go. I was just saying, they, they're on their I'm a real New Yorker. It. Well, the, those fire trucks are on their way to Madison Square Garden to extinguish one of the hottest teams in the NBA. Oh. Professional Woo! segue, Dang ladies way. and gentlemen. Um, so I like to get the perspective of other people outside of our little Knicks bubble on how the Knicks are doing. Mm. And look, I've already gone to the overreaction. I may have put down a prop future on the Knicks to win the Eastern Conference. It was just solely <laughs> because the odds are great and because the vibes are immaculate. Mm. But like in all seriousness, 6 and 0 since the Josh Hart trade, they're currently in, in fifth place in the in the Eastern Conference. They're two back of Cleveland for the the 4 seed. Um how do you how do you view what's going on in in New York and in uh, mm. Manhattan, I guess. And uh, like, what's going on with the Knicks right now? What's your perspective on this? I just fun to watch. I love Josh Hart. Like I always have. So I saw that happen and I was like, Oh, that's a good trade. That's a very, that's a very good move. He's just like a vibe. He's such a connector. And I feel like guys like that are so important. It really doesn't matter what 
team you are, whether you have stars or you don't like just guys like that are just so important. And like that really seems to galvanize them. I mean, I remember that game against the Nets. It was like, dude, this guy is like, <laughs> he's just like, he's taken over the game with energy. And um, Brunson's super fun to watch. Just like such a crafty score. Um, it's, it's funny as like covering the Nets now, you know, I, I, I just remember sitting there being like, God, they just don't have anybody like Brunson. They don't have anybody like Randall. Even like, it's like, it's uh, it, they're, they're very fun to watch. Um, and uh, I feel like they're picking up at the right time too. Like this is when you want to really kind of put that stretch run together these last 20 games. So yeah, just um, very enjoyable team. Um, and uh, that's pretty much where I'd leave it. I am very much enjoying them as yeah. well. And I look, I, I wonder how, how high this ceiling goes. By the way, I, me- I forgot to mention when Cam Johnson, the the one post game quarter or, or press conference quote that he gave um, is the most relatable thing that I've ever felt toward an NBA player. And it's when he talked about the traffic in Brooklyn. And <laughs> I was just like, yep. Every time I've gone to Brooklyn, whether it's, it's to, to meet up with a friend or yeah. to run an errand, and you're on the BQE for an hour to go four exits because you're hitting it at the right time. Uh, yes, I agree, Cam yep. Johnson. Welcome to not only Manhattan, not only to New York, but to Brooklyn. I don't know um, where Cam's at. But you, you, you learn to walk, my friend. I walk yes, everywhere. So that's the, yeah. listen. As someone in Queens, that I have enough suburb around me that a car is required, but okay. I also appreciate the the. The, everything's like a 10 minute walk away, you know, that yes. I'm, I'm able to appreciate that part of New York, although it snowed yesterday. So it, it's not, not the most opportune time to walk no. at the moment. No, you know? yeah, no. Uh, yeah. But you, you, you learn to walk is probably the best, best advice I could give. Maybe I'll let them know today. I'll be like, Hey man, like it's the culture shock from <laughs> going from Phoenix. Oh, where I know. It's like wide open desert to yeah. this has to be, has to be a yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I'm curious how this, this, this game is going to go as far as this matchup, as we wrap up, what mm. is the, the thing you're looking for? The most is it just like how the Nets look and and uh, the the chance to still fight for uh, an, an out of play-in uh, playoff position or are we kind of past that point and it's just like I'm looking for cohesive basketball at this point. <sighs> yeah, probably. Uh, just take steps defensively is the big thing. Um, I think the offense is going to be what it is. I I just don't know how much there's you can do with what they have. Like, all right, you're going to give. Bridges, pick and roll reps. You're going to see what you have in Cam Thomas. You know, it's kind of late in the game to be implementing a completely new offense. It's, I think that's going to be what it is. But defensively, yeah, can you take those steps? Can you get more comfortable uh, getting everybody on the same page, understanding um, terminology and just, you know, I, I guess like overall, just getting on the same page on that side. Like a good idea for the Nets is try to hold an opponent under 120 points. That would be the goal. <laughs> Is that they can't seem to do that. Oh wow! I didn't they realize that the, net, that the defense has fallen off that much so far. It's crazy. Yeah, they, they, I think they were thirtieth in defensive rating before uh, uh, the Atlanta game, and I can't imagine they've improved because they allowed, you know, uh, what one twenty nine against Atlanta. So, yeah, that's it. Just try to <laughs> start in small, baby. <laughs> yeah, geez. yeah. The last the two games since the break are one thirty one and one twenty nine against Chicago yeah. and Atlanta. I will say, I guess this is where I'm a. I was caught surprised by that because of the game against Philly where that looked like it went down to the wire, but I thought they played them tight. Even the first half against the Knicks looked pretty close. And then the Miami game, I I will say, I think that's more of a Miami thing. Yeah, it's less about the Nets defense and more about the Miami offense. Um, Mm -hmm. Man. All right. Well, I guess we'll see. And they're coming off. of Oh, wow. They're coming off a back to back. I didn't realize they're playing Milwaukee. It's Milwaukee. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, yep. It's a trap game. It's a it's a huge trap game for the Knicks. Like it it it's wow. Yeah, okay. but the goal for the Nets is just you know go two and two this week because they play Boston on Friday and then they play Charlotte. Uh, you know now without Lamelo Ball, which oh God that sucks. Yeah, um, it does. Uh, you know on Sunday, so yeah, <laughs> try not to go one and three is I guess the goal. <laughs> Uh, well, I, on behalf of Knicks fans everywhere, um, I 
I can't say I don't hope they, they yeah. <laughs> over the next four games. Yeah. Um, Matt, yeah. you've been great with your time. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, one more time, plug where people can find your, your writing yeah. and then where they can find your YouTube channel. Yeah, hell yeah. Uh, uh, you can find my video. I do a lot of threads. Um, I'm going to start doing some more on teams outside of the Nets. Um, on, on my Twitter, at Matt Brooks MBA. Um, and I do, and a lot of my work is like very film and analytical based. So I, started a YouTube channel what two years ago, I think. Um, and I do a lot of breakdowns of, of games. I'll be, as I said earlier, I'll be doing um, breakdowns of net stuff, but I really want to branch out and cover other teams, especially as we get into the playoffs. So also Matt Brooks NBA on YouTube. There you go. There give you them go. a follow, give them a subscribe, <laughs> uh, support the people that make time for us. And um, I hope for your sake and I'll, I'll extend the knowledge brand olive branch to the 87 net fans. Out there. Um, I hope this team is just quietly competent over the next calendar year. So when the Knicks play them next, whenever it is next season, that um, although maybe the way things are trending, that's the three six matchup. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm not that <laughs> delusional as a Knicks fan. Whenever the Nets play the Knicks again next season, um, I hope that it's it's oh wow they're they're like a solidly run fun you know, basketball team that's trying to build something. Cause yeah. that's at least the version of the team that I like grew to actually secretly like in 2019 before the Katie and Kyrie stuff came. Yeah. Through, you know? Yeah. Direction would be, would be appreciated. I <laughs> you think, think that's the big thing. <laughs> I'd, I'd be cool with it personally. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, for then just for your sake, for maybe not even the 87 net fans. <laughs> um, I hope for your sake that that, that happens. Uh, Matt, thanks for joining me, man. Appreciate it. Thank you.